Tis the season for winter weather, holiday cheer, and most importantly, for presents. But why do we like presents in the first place? What's happening in our brains on a biological level when we get or give a present? Are gifts being used to control our minds and influence our behavior by our friends, family, and even corporations? Uh? You're gonna be shocked at the answers. If you like presents, then like this video, subscribe to our channel, and get ready to unwrap the dark truth behind getting gifts. Today's subliminal messaging is brought to you by Buy Me Love gift card kits. The Beatles once said that money can't buy me love, but they were wrong and bad at science. Uh, hey, Paul, check this out. No, Rico, no! We're good at science. And we did the research in this video to know it feels better to give than to get. So this year, give your friends and family the greatest gift of all, the gift of giving you a gift. Link in the description below. Now, cozy up with a cup of hot chocolate because I'm Anya Kone, you're watching Headward, and the Headword of the week is gift. Why do humans give gifts? I don't like charity. I don't get it. Feels to me like I'm giving money away and getting nothing in return. Presents are a one-sided transaction. By definition, a gift is an object or act that is given from one person to another at some amount of cost. You can't just point at the air and say, you're welcome for the air. You have to spend something like effort, time, or money on a gift for it to be a gift. But giving a gift isn't actually a one-way street. According to this 2011 study about the gift of picking up the tab, presents are almost always given with the expectation of getting something in return, even if it's just returning the favor. Gift giving and receiving profoundly shapes human relationships. They bring us closer together by releasing neurotransmitters that encourage bonding. We especially like gifts that are experiences we can share. Imagine unwrapping a single ticket to your favorite musical artist. Bummer. All humans share the desire to give and receive presents. The practice probably predates humans, which means we didn't learn to give gifts, we evolved to give gifts. Your brain loves both getting and giving gifts, even if the gift is a little weird. It's my ticket a box. Simply put, it just feels good to get a gift and it feels even better to give a gift. In this 2013 study of 136 countries, they found that across every culture, rich or poor, it feels better to give a gift than buy something for yourself. Hoarding money like a Smaug or Scrooge McDucking it in a pool of gold is nice, but next time you're feeling down, try giving somebody a gift to cheer yourself up. There are three key regions involved in the brain when it comes to gifts. The temporoparietal junction, or TPJ, which is associated with the ability to understand that another person is conscious and feeling things just like you. We explore this theory of mind concept more thoroughly in our video about how horror works in the brain. So check it out if you're in the mood for a nightmare before Christmas. Then we have the anterior insula, which is responsible for affective empathy. It lets us not only understand other people are humans too, but it lets us imagine what they're experiencing. When we give people a gift or even think about it, we're imagining the joy they're going to experience when they open the gift. The last and juiciest brain region is the ventral striatum. It's tucked away in the deep brain and it makes giving and receiving gifts feel so good. These three regions work together to give us the gift of feeling good when we give or receive a physical gift. The temporoparietal junction lets us think about what kind of gift to give, and the anterior insula lets us imagine how the gift is going to make the recipient feel. Then, when we give the gift, we get that sweet, sweet dopamine. This is something else. There are two main neurotransmitters when it comes to gifting, but dopamine is by far the most impactful. We love this little guy because it acts in the nucleus accumbens and motivates us to give and receive gifts by making it feel great. You're searching for dopamine all the time. It is how you anticipate reward and evaluate a behavior for its potential reward. It's probably why you're watching this video right now. Wow. The second neurotransmitter that governs gifting behavior is a different member of the feel good gang. Oxytocin, which makes us feel bonded to those we love. 
In fact, the more oxytocin you have in your system, the more giving you're likely to be. And the more you're around giving and empathetic people, the more oxytocin your brain produces. We particularly like to share experiences with people we are psychologically close to, probably because of the increased oxytocin. It's not conclusive, but there's even research that dopamine increases when oxytocin is elevated. So the more you like a person, the better it will feel to give them a gift. Here's a Hanukkah hack. Make your presents heavier. The best gifts are sincere and useful. A practical gift makes the recipient feel closer to the giver than a more desirable or expensive gift, but we still want it to feel significant. This 2009 study found that humans put more value on heavier things. When we hold heavy things, we consider them to be more significant. So why not give a gift with some heft? Even if the actual gift is pretty light, put it in a box or a bag that feels heavy and they'll like the gift more. If you give somebody a gift, they'll like you. But if you can get somebody to give you a gift, they're more likely to cooperate with you in the future. Okay. That's what founding father Ben Franklin did with a stubborn and somewhat rude political opponent. Having heard that he had in his library a certain very scarce and curious book, I wrote a note to him expressing my desire of perusing that book and requesting he would do me the favor of lending it to me for a few days. He sent it immediately and I returned it in about a week with another note expressing strongly my sense of the favor. When we next met in the house, he spoke to me, which he had never done before, and with great civility. And he ever after manifested a readiness to serve me on all occasions, so that we became great friends, and our friendship continued to his death. Not Ben Franklin's death, mind you, but the other guy's. So next time you're struggling to persuade somebody, don't give them a gift. Trick them into giving you a gift, and they'll be more likely to help you out next time. Maybe even until they die. It's way more rewarding to give a gift than to get a gift, but not for the reason you might think, according to this 2008 study on the asymmetry of giving and receiving gifts. It turns out that it's just psychologically safer. Every time you give a gift, you're rewarded emotionally, but the receiver's emotional reward varies depending on how good the gift is. Also, getting a gift can create a lot of pressure to be grateful and anxiety about how to respond. The avocado! Thanks! You've heard, it's the thought that counts, meaning that simply giving a gift is what matters, not how good that gift is. Well, a 2012 study found that that's only true for the giver. The receiver cares about the thought, but they definitely want the gift to be good. However, the impact of a gift is often dramatically underestimated by the giver. This means that even though people might not like your gift every time, you're safe to feel good because on average, you're underestimating how good a gift makes the other person feel. Is charity a drug? A 2013 study found that employees in the industries of banking, sports teams, and pharmaceuticals were more satisfied when their employers offered pro-social bonuses. They were happier when their Christmas bonuses were used as charity donations and expenditures on teammates. A 2008 study found that people who spend their own money on others are happier than those who spend their own money on themselves. But they might be doing it for selfish reasons. It's like a drug to give gifts. People love the feeling they get when giving gifts, more than they care about the actual result of the gift. We feel good even when they never return the favor, and once we've given somebody a gift once, we're more likely to do it again. Clark, that's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. When we give a gift, we care more about the gift's timing, what it is, and how fancy it is than the receiver. The behavior of the recipient is almost irrelevant, almost. We really care about their immediate reaction. This 2018 study shows that gift givers care more about the receiver's reaction to the gift than if the recipient actually likes the gift. The giver doesn't care if the receiver actually likes the present as long as they act like they do. That's one of the takeaways from this study about the smile-seeking hypothesis. Basically, 
As long as the recipient of the gift smiles and you feel that warm glow, that's all that matters. To extrapolate, even if we learned that a gift had a terrible consequence, as long as we felt good giving it, we'll do it again. That's like if you donated blood for many, many years, then found out your blood was being used to farm mosquitoes, and then signing up to donate more blood. That's a pretty selfish gift. Gift giving is famously a love language, but love languages probably aren't real according to this study. That mother back there is not real. After a gift exchange, whether you were on the giving or receiving end, you behave more cooperatively towards the other person. This is fundamental to the human condition and is probably ancient. It's widely believed among researchers that gift giving practices began with cavemen. Although they weren't able to gift each other cash or Amazon gift cards, they still gave each other special presents like animal teeth or weird looking rocks to strengthen their connection with each other, just like we do today. I guess not much has changed in that regard, except for the teeth and the rocks. There's an interesting study that explores how food gifts used in bird mating rituals are eventually replaced with technically worthless tokens, like shiny stuff. Thanks for the porcelain baby, Grandma. Giving a gift to a casual acquaintance won't feel as good as giving a gift to, say, your parents or your girlfriend. A 2011 study proved that the level of intimacy in the relationship was more important than the type of relationship. The more we care about a person, the more satisfaction we get out of giving that person a gift. The reverse is also true. When a woman receives a gift from a man she likes, the activity in her anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC, and its supplemental motor areas in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex increases, which is where action monitoring and emotional and cognitive decision-making occurs. When a woman likes the man that's giving her a gift, she likes the gift more. When your fiance buys you an engagement ring, it feels better than when a random guy buys you an onion ring. If the woman is indifferent towards the man giving her the gift, even if it is the same gift, there is no change in the activity in the ACC. She simply doesn't care about the gesture. Gift giving is a form of communication, and all communication takes place in the context of culture. All of our brains evolve to give and receive gifts, but the specific meaning and rituals around those gifts varies widely. Countries around the world all have unique customs and views when it comes to gifts. For example, some Asian countries refuse to accept gifts when they are first offered, so make sure to offer your gift more than once. In East Asian countries, gift givers are often expected to use both hands when presenting their gift to the recipient, while in India and Middle Eastern countries, gifts are traditionally given with the right hand. One of the more widespread views regarding gift giving practices is that gifting sharp objects such as knives and scissors indicate the desire to sever the relationship. If you want to maximize the oxytocinergic bonding effect of giving a gift, then it's important to keep cultural differences in mind when gift shopping. That's my opinion! Japan has intricate rules for gift giving. A visually pleasing presentation is extremely important. This obsession with aesthetics led to the earliest practice of gift wrapping, all the way back in the 1600s with the traditional cloth wrapping known as furoshiki. Paper covering has long been a popular method of gift wrapping in the West. Upper class Victorians used decorated paper and ribbons. In the early 20th century, tissue paper became such a popular method of wrapping that a stationery store in Kansas City sold out of it entirely. They decided to use a much fancier paper intended for envelope interiors. Ornate wrapping paper was invented as a result, and of course, that sold out too. All gifts come with baggage. There is a fundamental subconscious expectation of reciprocation, but sometimes that pressure becomes a means to manipulate others, like in the form of a bribe or an offer you can't refuse. A 2024 study walks through the process politicians in New Zealand use to decide if they can accept a gift. First, they make sure the gift doesn't break rules, like directly accepting money. Second is context and perception. How would the public react to the gift? Example, if an oil executive gives you money to pollute a lake, that would be bad. Third, 
Does the gift violate your personal values? And fourth, do both giver and receiver benefit? Gifts can be a bit sneaky. They're like little brain worms that make you more likely to bend the knee to the giver's desires. You better believe companies are taking advantage. Using the word gift or hero in reference to an action or behavior that someone else is doing can make the involuntary gift giver feel obligated to continue the behavior, even at their own expense. This is often exploited to coerce healthcare workers to stay late or cover shifts they wouldn't have covered otherwise. You think that's bad? Big Pharma loves to give free gifts to physicians. There's rules around how big the gifts can be, and acceptable gifts must be simple and insignificant, like pens or a notepad. But the science shows that no matter how small the gift may be, they still have a subconscious effect on physician behavior. A gift from a big pharma company makes doctors like that company more and realigns their loyalties, even if only by a small amount. Funny she didn't write on us though. Must be afraid of reprisals. Streamers, OnlyFans, and politicians all depend on gifts from their audience. Gift behavior to a public figure depends on how highly regarded that figure is by an individual. The attractiveness, subject expertise, and parasocial interactions of the public figure all matter. But the most important element is how the viewer perceives their relationship with the public figure. If they think they're really important to the politician or streamer, then they're much more likely to give. All donation-based professions are leveraging that fundamental biology behind gift giving in order to profit. Is that evil or just the way the world works? Let us know in the comments. Today we learned about the origin and nature of gifts, how gifts affect different brain regions and the main neurotransmitters involved. We learned about the different cultural contexts of gift giving and how companies are using gifts to control people. We also learned that gifts are a fundamental part of being human and that they bring us together. Do you have any other subjects you're curious about? Let us know in the comments below and we might make your suggestion into the next video. Please like this video and subscribe to Headward for your daily dose of dopamine. We post bite-sized brain science videos all the time to explore all things catchy. I'm Anya Kone. Hope you enjoyed this episode of Headward and we'll see you next time. I don't like charity. I don't get it.